see a happy number of survivors, so I guess all is well. And we hope that you will remember in general the outline that we attempted to provide at the last of these talks. We were studying the septenary nature of the causal agent at the base of life. And from the time we established this archetypal septenary, we must observe the universe unfolding according to the exact repetitions of this pattern. The pattern is modified, of course, by the particular species or type of life, but it forever re-impresses itself forming a basic key by which all things can be estimated. This key was the great law of analogy, which was, of course, the principal instrument of ancient instruction, although in more recent times it has passed out of favor. The law of analogy, however, is still valid in a great many levels of thinking. For we do recognize, for instance, in the law of octaves, a principle of analogy. We recognize it also in our color harmonies and in our correlations between sound and color, as in certain musical instruments that have been more recently devised. This evening, however, we want to take our pattern and apply it specifically to the development of a planet. And in so doing, we remember our basic thought from before, namely that bodies come into manifestation from a circumferential field or a magnetic field which is the true boundary or area set aside for manifestation. That creation is a process of gradual restriction or compression by means of which agencies, elements, principles, energy retire from the circumference or field to a center. And in this center they form the objective or physical manifesting body of the structure under consideration. Thus we have the rule which the ancients knew so well, for example, namely that bodies are not containers actually of souls, but souls are contained uh, within bodies in a peculiar way. For example, Always the superior must contain that which is less than itself, for all inferiors are restrictions or compressions within the spheres or areas of a superior principle. Thus man's spirit is not in the body, the body is in the spirit. For the spirit represents the field of energy, and the body represents a focal point set up within this field due to the gradual flowing of energies from the area of the field to a center, leaving behind what is called a privation, or an abyss, or a hyal, as the ancients call it. So let us then apply this thinking to our planet system, and let us take the familiar Egyptian symbol, which was perhaps one of our earliest instruments of educational analogy, the cross-section of an onion. When the Egyptian wanted to teach his son astronomy, he simply cut an onion in half and explained the mystery to the lad, that is, in case the lad was still able to see the concentric rings. But in any event, the Egyptians pointed out that a solar system, a planet, the human magnetic field itself, each of these structures, by analogy similar, consisted of a series of concentric zones and these zones were created or set into activity 
by the gradual retiral of energy from the, sub from the circumference to the center. Thus we have these zones coming into existence one after another and continuing to form concentrically within each other from the outside toward the center until finally in the middle of area the physical planet itself was brought into existence. Thus a planet consists of a body and a septenary of superphysical principles. This septenary of superphysical principles in the solar system was represented by the field of the planets. And the seven planets recognized by the ancients, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, uh, Mercury, and the Moon. The Moon and Sun being regarded as planets in ancient astronomy. These represent the seven layers or spheres of the onion, represented by the cross-section of the solar system. These seven together operated upon in and through the earth, which was the eighth sphere or the eighth part of the soul. Thus the invisible bodies of a planet represent its soul bodies, and its visible form, which is set up in the center or in the midst of them, receives into itself, as into a cup, or as the ancients call it, a crater, all of the energies of the superphysical field. Now when a planet is fashioned, all of these fields of invisible energy, through a series of concentric restrictions, compress until they finally result in a pressurified area in the very center of the field of the planetary body. And this pressured area slowly begins to glow. And from this glowing, there comes into existence the nebulous, fiery body of a planet. This body is being bombarded constantly from its own mag mag magnetic fields. It is being sustained like the flame of a lamp by a wick dipped deep in oil. The oil is invisible. In this case, the wick is invisible, but the flame is visible. But the life and power and energies of bodies, these are communicated to the bodies from their energy fields. And wherever a form lives, it is because of an invisible light agent behind it. And this invisible life agent is always a septenary of some kind manifesting through an eighth sphere or eighth part, its body or vehicle. Now if we had lived or could live many millions, hundreds of millions of years ago, when this planet was in the forming, we might have had different kinds of vision. We might have looked out into space where this planet was going to be. And had we a certain kind of extrasensory gamut, we could have seen a tremendous radiant sphere into, uh, divided into concentric rings of color like a circular rainbow. These rings of vibrant light, concentric like the rings of a target. So we could have seen a blazing field of light in which the colors of the spectrum were distributed in concentric bands. Under those conditions, if our sight was focused upon this phase of the phenomena, we would observe in the center of this where the bullseye of the target would be, or something like the bullseye, a dark, dimensionless area, a depth, a mysterious field of night, and this we could not penetrate with the same vision with which we could see this wonderful field of, of magnificent moving color. But if we could change our focus of vision now to a physical level, slowly all this wonderful field of light would disappear. And in its place, in the center of the target, a smoldering coal would appear a kind of fiery 
mysterious gaseous globe and this globe would be luminous with the power of these invisible energies but we could no longer see them and perhaps something resembling a small moon at sunset when the moon is first visible as a kind of uh, orange disk on the horizon might be more like what we would see. And this the um, ancient scientists and the more modern scientists believed to have been a planet in a molten state. It was not actually molten as we know it. It was a living entity gradually beginning to build bodies and drawing these bodies from the field of energy around it and making the body visible by consolidating the elements which compose it, compressing them. Now we know today that we can take invisible elements in the atmosphere and by placing them under tremendous pressure cause them to be visible. And the same thing nature was doing, causing out of an invisible material a visible one to come by bringing the parts closer and closer together. So ultimately, a visible form seemed to emerge from this strange field. And it emerged from darkness because the eyes that could see the form would not be able to see the light field behind it or around it. Now this form, which was to be our planet, we'll say for the moment, was of perhaps the uh, solidity of a gaseous vapor. It was something that could support no life as we know life. It had no mountains, rock, earth, anything that we know. Were we placed upon it, we would fall through it into space. It was simply a field of semi-visible energy. Gradually, this process of, of consolidation continued. And through great periods of bombardment from the magnetic field around it, forcing it, forcing it, making this globe continuously smaller, and in so doing, forcing the particles in closer and closer relationship to each other. And these particles coming under the controlling power of element binders, ether, energy fields of ether. Ultimately, this ball began to take on greater and greater solidity. Now this ball was moving. It was rotating and revolving. The primary motion that concerns us was the rotation. Because as these elements and substances increase in density, Rotation seems to have caused them to move toward the polar fields. Perhaps one of the reasons being that the rotation was least rapid at the polar area and most rapid at the equator. Therefore, the friction between the surface of this field of energy, the globe, and the outer space wall around it the friction was greater at the equator, lesser at the pole. In time, this mysterious nebula, as in certain uh, nebulas that we see in the sky today, takes, uh, took on a kind of what we would call dumbbell shape. It was in this case a vertical dumbbell, with its axis, the handle, running upward hypothetically toward the pole star. And this dumbbell consisted of a darker, a more semi-solid shape still existing within the globular field of mist or of this nebulous agent, which was the field of its formation. And ultimately, in the motion of this, we begin to see on this energy field globe, this kind of luminous mist body 
what uh, astronomers perhaps uh, recognize today as the polar cap of Mars. We begin to see an area gradually differentiating from the general appearance and forming the primary indications of solidity, the, arise, the arising of the solid in the midst of the dense. Because solidity, in a strange way, is the opposite of density. In the creation of these two solid zones, like caps on the two polar extremities of this luminous disk or luminous globe, we also find a parallel in the development of the fecundated ovum in the development of the embryo. When the cell fission begins in the multiplication of the cell to form the body of a human being or of an animal, the first division of cells takes place at the north pole of the original cell. And this division results in a gradual development of a cap-like structure over the pole a single layer of cells that also ultimately becomes uh, a multi-layer structure and extends downward around the uh, boundary of the cell. But all cells begin to multiply their cellular structures from their polar caps. And the same thing happens or happened with the planet. By degrees this area of so-called solidity appeared and became increasingly solid and hard, forming two gradually de uh, increasingly dense islands, one at the North Pole and one at the South Pole. It was in these areas, therefore, the polar region, that the first solid substances of what we call the planet Earth were available, called the polar continents. These were divided by most of the planetary surface as we know it, which was still in a semi-luminous, semi-fiery state, and therefore could not yet sustain life. Actually, the entire planet also was completely enveloped in a mist, which is referred to in the ancient writings as the fire mist. And could any creature have existed on it at that time, such a creature looking out from the surface of this fiery ball would have seen nothing but red reflected back to him from the mystical atmosphere around him because he could not penetrate beyond uh, this fire mist zone. According to the old philosophical teaching, the development of the two islands, one at the north and one at the south, polar cap, resulted in the gradual incarnation of certain agencies from the auric fields or the seven superior bodies containing within themselves this physically developing earth. In other words, as the earth developed, it became quickened. Life began to move into first the atmosphere of the earth and finally into the physical structure itself. All forms coming into manifestation upon the surface of the earth came from its own magnetic fields or came from the superior zones of color, the septenary structure which surrounds the earth. At the beginning, of course, uh, these forms that were built or were gradually fashioned out of these substances had to have the same material substance in them as their world. Therefore, as the ancient reports tell us, in the beginning uh, beings existed that seemed to be more like flames than anything else. They were simply luminous forms, fireflies in a flame, mysterious fiery whirlwinds and swirls within the great fiery atmosphere because the bodies could not be composed of anything separate from the material available 
Had any body such as we know today been there, it would have been immediately consumed by combustion. It couldn't exist. There was a story also that when these polar caps became gradually more and more solid, that they became the abode of the first divine beings that descended from the higher atmosphere or walked down the ladder of seven rungs or this field or zone of concentric color uh, magnetic disks within which the earth existed. This original north polar cap was also referred to as the imperishable island, the abode of the gods and is recognized by the Mongolians and traders as being the site of the mysterious Shambhala in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. That here was the imperishable outcropping of Azoic rock, the mother rock, the parrot rock of the whole earth, the oldest substance there is. And this, of course, also became the basis of the first continent, the first development of a region or an area in which life of some kind could begin to develop. Now there has been a great deal of question and thought as to how life reached the earth. Recent uh, researchers in uh, the um, outer space balloon ascensions and things of that nature, the stratosphere exploration, seem to indicate the existence in space, that is in the space around the earth, of free spores which have an eternal existence in space. In other words, space itself, as we call it, is filled with spore-like seeds that can be attracted or brought within the area of a planet. And therefore, that all planets can be, and probably originally were, given living organisms out of this spore field of the sun itself. Not only does the sun supply the nutrition, but the sun sustains free seeds in vacuum. And these seeds, being constantly present in space, planets and bodies moving through space, draw these within their atmospheres, and these seeds and spores fall upon the planets and begin uh, their evolutionary development. Actually, the older teaching tells us that these spores were oozed out of the superior bodies or the invisible forms surrounding the material planets. And this would not in any way be inconsistent with the scientific thought. Now how did these forms begin to develop upon the earth? Obviously the earth had to pass through various stages and in each of these stages different types of forms made their appearances. Some of these forms probably lasted a few million years, perhaps some of them a thousand million years. But the endless changing in the structure and in the pressure, the atmospheric conditions and the temperature of the earth resulted in a continuous modification of these forms. Needless to say, the earliest and most ancient forms survived the longest, because actually in these earlier forms there was less a compound. They were simpler structures. And compounds are the things which ultimately produce wear and tear or destruction. Also in the beginning of forms on the earth, reproduction was unknown. Therefore, forms had to be endowed with surviving quality. At one time, survival or reproduction became a matter of fission. Forms divided. This procedure continued until forms disappeared through infinite division. Later to this form dividing procedure was added a new dimension, namely the power of the part to grow or develop and become equal to the total. This was an entirely different type of development. Later propagation consists of exuding egg-like structures 
from the surfaces of these forms. And we had a very complicated problem of how uh, formal life began on the planet. Actually, it seems to have had its primary beginning in the process of decay. Wherever we have stagnation, the scum or film that gathers on water, wherever we have decomposition, we have the emergence of a living organism. And in the elos, as the Greek call it, or primordial slime of space, a decomposition took place from which life came. Life in this case, of course, being formed, uh, beginning to develop uh, instruments uh, for the embodiment of the energy fields behind it. Now, in the atmosphere of the Earth, we have these seven orbits. Therefore, in these seven orbits, we have a certain number of life forms developing. As far as we are able to know uh, in this evolutionary cycle, the life cycle of form generation on the planet resulted in the emergence of four essential types. These four essential types are what we call the mineral, vegetable, animal, and human. These four types seem to exhaust that part of the septenary body of a planet which seeks embodiment in its own physical structure. That there are three other orders of life relating to the planet, we know, but these other three orders of life do not appear physically. Therefore, they were believed by the ancients to represent angelic, archangelic beings, invisible creatures, of a higher order than man, but creatures which do not become embodied and are visible therefore only to the mystical apperceptions or invisible faculties of the human being. But four orders of life certainly began to develop upon the physical earth as we know it. And these became one by one the instruments uh, for the manifestation of the invisible powers of the rings or orbits uh, that form this uh, concatenation of worlds behind the physical. Now these bodies began to compound almost immediately. We had the mineral and then we had the plant. And in the mineral we had a single organism, a single body. In the plant we have two bodies because we also have a mineral body and now added a vital growth factor. In the animal, we have three bodies. And in man, we have a fourfold differentiation. For in man, we have mineral, vegetable, animal, and human. And yet, although these four are combined within man, there is still around him a world containing these other kingdoms. All minerals, therefore, are not tied up in the body of man. All uh, minerals are not tied up within the body of plants. Some minerals are in plant forms, some are in animal forms, some are in human forms, and some still remain mineral. Thus we have these lower kingdoms, or these evolving forms, existing both free and in compound. Now we know also that these various mineral elements must have their own cycles of evolution. And in the kingdoms of, in nature around us, this evolution is involved in their incorporation into the structure of higher divisions or racial levels or type levels of their own kind. Thus, for instance, a mineral cycle of evolution is attained by a mineral first in its mineral state secondly becoming incorporated in a plant, third by being becoming incorporated in an animal, fourth by being incorporated in the body of a human being, then retiring back to the disintegration of these bodies to its own root. We have a complete evolutionary arc for the mineral consciousness to its compounds. Now we also have a complete arc for 
the vegetable consciousness. Because we have the vegetable consciousness free in its own nature as a vegetable. Then passing into compound with an animal to form the vegetable structure of an animal body. Later becoming involved in the human where it becomes part of the vegetable structure of a human body. But now we have one missing. So the plant consciousness has to proceed to a plus X which we do not see at the top. It has to go one step higher than man in order to complete its cycle and be incorporated as a vital principle in the organism of one of the invisible hierarchs which are beyond man and drop back again to its own level. And so we find the, ele the body or elemental principles evolving through compounds just as man does. And the development or evolution of these is through their association with superior organisms. A simple example of what we mean, perhaps, would be the example of the person and the dog. The individual who has the dog for the pet gradually creates a sympathy with the dog. The dog's own evolution and growth is certainly advanced by its association with the human being on a constructive and sympathetic level. The dog becomes apparently almost human in its intelligent reaction, such as the seeing eye dog. It seems to take on amazing capacities and abilities, yet actually it remains a dog. But through intimate association with the magnetic field of human beings, the animal's own growth is intensified. Just in the same way as man believes that through becoming mystically or spiritually attuned to a superior level of life, or brought into more intimate contact with great spiritual beings or gods, that man through this association also has his growth intensified or is carried further upward in his own evolution by association with superior levels of consciousness. Uh, that is all we can do with that particular theme, but it opens a large subject if we want to work with it. Now in this period where this beginning of a continental distribution uh, was noted or was unfolding upon the polar extremities of the earth. A new series of situations also introduced themselves. The north pole of the earth became more or less in the ancient mythologies the abode of the suras or spirits of light, the good spirits. The south pole became associated with the asuras or the dark spirits, the evil powers. Therefore, uh, two warring camps, polarization, began to be manifested. Light and darkness, good and evil, right and wrong, faith and fear, were associated psychologically with these two great zones or areas. And each one moving toward the equator, the northern continent moving downward around the sides of the globe, the southern continent moving upward around the sides of the globe, became almost like two halves gradually coming together like this to meet at the equator. The upper hand in this case corresponds with what we call the arterial system in the human body. Uh, the lower hand reaching up below became equivalent uh, to the venous system of the body, the veins. Thus a great system of circulation began to envelop and encircle the globe, forming in the invisible atmosphere that we see a complete group of circulational factors an arterial system and a venous system carried in the invisible ethers of space. As a result of this mingling of these two systems, 
the trunks of which extend ultimately back to the great solar heart, the sun, in magnetic fields, we have the trunks of these systems now visible to us symbolically as luminous emanations. And the arterial pole of the earth is surrounded by the spectacle which we can occasionally see, uh, the aurora borealis, whereas the southern pole is associated with the aurora australis, or the two great magnetic poles which have to do with the earth. One of nourishment and the other of the carrying away of waste matter. One of nutrition, the other of elimination. And these two great systems flow from the sun through the structure of the earth and back to the sun again. And we have perfect parallels to this process in the arterial and venous circulation of a vital organ in the human body and how this circulation ultimately leads back again to the sun or heart. Thus we have the earth supplied with its basic um, processes of nutrition and elimination so that the poisons of the breaking down of worlds, of bodies and so forth, can be naturally carried away, whereas nutrition also becomes available constantly from the solar level of the atmosphere. Here, perhaps, is a problem that we must have to face someday. We cannot afford to put too great a strain upon this great uh, system of circulation which involves our planet. We are now beginning to suspect, and perhaps justly, that the air around us, like the ocean, is able to take care of a certain amount of contamination. And if the contamination exceeds that amount, then the air itself becomes contaminated. And we have danger to life, because we cannot cleanse this circulation as rapidly as we pollute it. And the answer, perhaps, is a more organic process than our present scientific opinion might be. It is quite possible that we shall ultimately learn that in these ethers of space there are complete structures which can be studied physiologically if we have the faculties or instruments to measure them. Certainly the ancients held this to be distinctly true. So out of all of these wonders and mysteries of things come the first great continent of the earth. And a continent is a diffusion or distribution of habitable area and usually ocean or some form of, humanly speaking, uninhabitable area. And the first great division, which was to become the sustaining power of the first race of mankind, was the great Polarian diffusion, which is measured up to the time in which the Polarian uh, geographical, geological distribution reached its zenith, or reached its maximum. In that time, we have what was called the first continent. And the first continent, in all probability, consisted of nearly the entire area of the Earth. There was probably very little water as we know it, because the combustion and heat would have made water almost impossible. And from a philosophical standpoint, it is necessary that the first continent should have included every square inch of land that could possibly appear in any of the others. Because the first continent is archetypal. The first continent is the true continent. Just as the Adam Kadmon, or the archetypal man, is the total man. And humanity individualizes within him, but he is not divided. Thus, the first continent is the total continent of the earth. And continental forms change within that continent. But that continent never dies, never ceases, never ends, as long as the earth continues. All other continents are modifications of it. 
in the same way the first race of men passed through all the modifications of the other seven or the other six major races and the seven times seven sub races yet the parent race never dies nor does the parent race retire into some far corner of the earth the parent race is forever buried in its own progeny forever continues through all the manifestations of itself so the first continent continues always as the the basic foundation of continents and here the first species or type of life which we know gradually manifested itself as we have a special discussion coming on another evening relating to the types of life developing on these continents we want to limit our particular discussion tonight to the continental distribution itself now in those days such records as we know indicate that the Polarian epic which probably extended into a period of several hundred millions of years that the Polarian epic moved from the time uh, when the first solid earth appeared until the maximum degree of surface crystallization was accomplished this surface crystallization formed a crust of comparatively solid substance over the surface of this field of energy that was swirling as a flame in the center of the orbit of the planet later this crystallization continued to go deeper and we find the gradual formation of the earth itself the ancients telling us that in contradiction to the general belief of the geologists that the hard core of the planet did not come first but last for the planet must do the same thing that everything else does it becomes more and more formal as it descends into uh, the crust which formed its surface but within that surface is another solar system in reverse moving toward the core of the planet and this core of the planet again corresponds to space it corresponds to the highest part of the solar system so we have a very curious structure and of course no one up to the present time has ever been able to explore the substance and elements composing the core of the planet in any event the polarian species or period with its form of life supplied only a very uncertain and environment for the development of living things these living things had to be without any structural form such as we know therefore they could leave no bones in the rocks they could leave no fossil remain they could leave no trace of artifact of any kind because nothing could have survived the vicissitudes of heat and uh, combustion that distinguished that era thus the ancients tell us that these creatures that were beginning to move into this fire mist were called children of the fire mist they were like the Nibelungen people of the Nordic myths they were creatures composed of luminous fiery bodies like the salamanders of legendary they could live in the fire just as surely as there are beings that can live in the combustion heat of the sun but they are not like ourselves but these bodies and souls living in the fire mist of the polarian world had very slight environmental advantage there was nothing they could do except to project forms from their own levels of consciousness so in these creatures as in the embryo which recapitulates this whole early evolutionary process the consciousness of the incarnating being was not in the body but the body was a projection of that consciousness downward into a state of sleep 
Thus, if the being that created the fire mist form or was projected into it had any awareness of it at all, it was the awareness of a sleeper imagining in his sleep that he was floating in flames. He would awaken periodically and find that he was awake in another world and that he had only dreamed of the flames. Buddhism also points out the rather interesting possibility that all bodies, all informants, are a kind of dreaming. Certainly this would be the case in the primary structure of the Polarian epic. So these beings were simply learning how to manipulate the subtle substances of their world. Now when the world began to crystallize and grow more and more, dense and physical, what happened to the fire mist? What happened to this luminous atmosphere the first bodies were composed of? It did not cease. This luminous fire mist retired into the arterial system and became the life of the blood. And the human blood, in the living body of a person, carries within it, in the deeper parts of it, the residual remains of the fire mist. It has to remain, just as man's spatial structure still shows the rudiments of gills derived from the time when he had to live in an atmosphere that was mostly water. So all these ancient parts never die. They retire into specialized attributes and become uh, associated with levels or degrees of man's present growth and culture. In the beginning of this period also, we see the beginning of the differentiation between fire and water. For gradually this tremendous combustion, striking outer atmosphere, physically, coldness, the strange coldness of the cosmic night seems to have produced a mysterious fluid out of space, a, a mysterious substance resident in the magnetic spheres of energy. And this was precipitated to form water. This water, as it precipitated, striking heat, gas, combustion, form terrible outbursts and also masses of steam as we find in the story of the Nordic sagas where in Ganunga Gap, the cleft in space, the flame giants and the frost giants through their elements formed this terrible combustion and from it was fashioned the body of Ema, the frost giant of the ancient Scandinavian creation myth. In any event, gradually, this combination resulted in the rise of the second great order of the world. And from the Polarian cycle, or the Polarian distribution of continental uh, area, came forth the Hyperborea, which was a Greek term meaning a land beyond or above the wind. It was generally assumed to be a land north of the habitable area which the Greeks recognized as their own homeland. But in the ancient philosophical concepts, the Hyperborean distribution, or the second great continental organization, was not due to something being added, but due to the fact that certain parts of the Polarian world sank. That is, they disappeared from the surface appearance of things, leaving the outlines of scattered continents. Other areas uh, that uh, had previously been won or broken or fragmented to form perhaps islands or smaller chains. And by degrees, this formation moving further southward, we find that water began to flow and mingle uh, with land to begin the structure of oceans. These oceans in almost constant turmoil. Uh, these oceans filled with volcanic vents 
and horrible combustions constant, so that the surface of the earth was now no longer essentially covered with a strange fiery glow, but now with a white cloudy steam, ooze, a, a strange humidity filling everything. And it was this humid type of atmosphere which enabled the release of the plant germs that were later to become involved in the evolution of the planet. At that time also forms and organisms began to take on plant type of life. We are told in the ancient writings that the life at that time was reminiscent of what we would call fungus. It was this like the great toadstools and mushrooms, uh, but they were fantastic in shape, much more sensitive and highly organized than what we know today. And these forms of life grew quickly, grew some of them to considerable size, and were frequently destroyed in the tremendous combustions of nature. Therefore, forms were forever engendering and forever being destroyed. And in this procedure, uh, the plant process of reproduction began to appear because these forms had to reproduce or become extinct. And nature, never permitting the extinction of its purpose, began to create the problem of the seed, the possibility of these lives perpetuating themselves in one way or another. And in this we have the, the hypoborean species, symbolically represented by blind giants, titanic forces, forces of tremendous strength and power, but with comparatively slight organization. Here also uh, beings about to form such bodies still were aware of them only as something outside of themselves, something seen in another level of dreaming. But now the dreaming was more vivid. Now the being became involved in his own dream, yet he could waken and discover himself back again in the celestial bridge, far above the seething, whirling world that was developing around him. This went on for a great period of time, and the combination of the cooling effects of these forces of humidity and water, the gradual development of uh, what we call decay or uh, disintegration, releasing life, plant life, we have the third distribution of continental area, which is called the Lemurian. Now, the Lemurian area was again a further shuffling of land arrangements. These were not continents like North America or South America, one of which went up and another one went down. They were complete distributions of the whole Earth's surface, with distribution of ocean and land, with seas and lakes and rivers, but with contours slightly different from those which we know today. Where we now have oceans, they had land. Where they had oceans, we have land. And the great area of the Lemurian culture, the area in which it seems to have developed itself most enormously, or to have reached its highest degree of attainment as a cultural zone, was this great area which we call now Gondwana land, or the Australasian Archipelago moving further over and including part of the islands of Ceylon and going on and on over to include Africa and part of Madagascar. It is an enormous land area. And this land area was the home of the transitional forms which began to develop into uh, capacities to possess our whole life within themselves. It was at the time of the great Lemurian epoch, or the Lemurian age of the earth, that the first ensoulment, or the first true quickening of the human form took place. 
the early part of the Lemurian epic was animal. And it was during this period that the great order of prehistoric monsters came into existence, as described by Besource in uh, his Chaldean Cosmogony. He reports reasons that become more apparent as we proceed. Nature went on one of its strangest sprees to produce uh, mosquitoes a foot and a half across, to produce bats with wing spreads of 20 feet, to produce, uh, as the small school boy said, the great uh, monster, uh, the Brontosaurus, and his little brother, the Dinkysaurus. But in any event, it to produce all kinds of strange creatures. This was the time of the Mastodon, this was the time of the pterodactyl and all the weird beings and creatures of this nightmare. Creatures 60 feet long with brains no larger than those of birds. The, uh, this was a very strange, a strange world. But why did it happen? Are we going to find any reason that we can think of for this? One of the things that apparently was happening is that nature was beginning to move its resources toward the production of an instrument capable of being used for the total embodiment of the compound of mind, soul, emotion, and uh, the body faculties or functions. To achieve this, nature apparently first permitted form to run wild. And then gradually, Having built these tremendous bodies, nature then placed the seat of brain within them and began to draw upon them to support brain until these bodies were gradually absorbed downward into approximately their present relationships, the body becoming more or less the nutritional field to feed the strange group of faculties and powers that were developing within the cranial structure. Now at this time also, there are many legends and stories concerning uh, the division which we call the missing link. And also the great question as to how a man was differentiated in this great geological process. Now the fact of the matter seems to be as we go back to the ancient writings that whether we realize it or not when a handful of seed we will say was cast into the abyss of earth in the beginning there was more than one kind of seed. There were essentially four kinds of seed representing four levels of incarnating beings from this atmospheric world of magnetism behind the invisible world. Now as these seeds fell into the environmental circumstances into which, or through which the earth was passing, each one of these types of seed reached its own degree of development and then individualized. The seed with the superior potential then continued its embryonic period for a longer time and then individualized. For instance, if you study the embryo of the human being and the chicken today, there is a period in which you cannot tell them apart. It is only after they have reached a certain degree that suddenly the chicken embryo stops growing and becomes a chicken and is born. The human embryo continues to live types became extinct and the other continued to live, continued to go on and continued to pass through continuing uh, modifications of structure until gradually out of this prehistoric distribution there uh, took place the thing which Darwin describes for us, namely this ascent in which out of the mammal, out of the link, perhaps out of the anthropoidal uh, juncture between uh, the divisions of mammals, man came, different from the other. <laughs>
Yet man was never the horse, never the brontosaurus in the true sense of the word. Although his growth had to be through these forms, he was always potentially himself because he contained within himself the capacity for a kind of growth that survived the process of being born into a lower kingdom that just refused to be born and lost there. It kept on going until finally it reached its humanity and then it was born. Now when this differentiation took place I don't presume that we would have been particularly excited over the early product. In other words, uh, perhaps if we had been able to take a good look at the world at that time and had seen our own progenitor and compared that progenitor with some finely constructed member of the animal kingdom, we would say that man represented a distinct loss of ground. In other words, he does not necessarily, uh, did not necessarily at that time have even the semi uh, prepossessing attributes of Gabriel Mack's painting of the missing link. He, uh, he, was, he was not, he left much to be desired from a cosmetic standpoint. He was probably less efficient, less effective than the animal. He probably had a very difficult early struggle because gradually this change in his development and growth, his growth being slower, the need for protecting him during infancy was greater than that of any other animal. Gradually changes had to take place and the survival of man against the primary world around him was possible only because he possessed the rudiment of a superior faculty of cognition. He possessed something, mind, even though it was only in rudiment, which still gave him just the edge necessary for survival. If he hadn't possessed that, he probably would not have survived. But in the Lemurian world, which was distributed over this vast area, we see the gradual development of man. We see the division taking place. And finally, man and the animal previously not distinguishable, thrown into contrast with each other. And out of that, the inevitable victory of the man over the animal. The gradual rise of the first primitive social state, in comparison to which that the Digger Indian or anything that we know today would be comparatively highly elevated. Every once in a while, we hear of someone who has had a long, uh, long conversation with some Lemurian priest or something on the Ouija board. It's all right, but we have very little uh, reason to assume that the Lemurian priest uh, would know anything that could possibly be of interest to us. Because actually the Lemurian priesthood was lower than any form of human life we have on earth today. Yet in its own time, it was the highest life then on the planet because all the other life belonged to a different order. A man began to make that little stone axe. He began to learn how to throw the rock. He learned how to find the cave and hide. He learned by degrees to create the bone fish hook and ultimately he discovered fire. And when he discovered fire, he became master of the world. So, in these days, man and the animal looked very much alike. They ate the same food. They lived in the same range. They struggled for the same values. And according to the ancient traditions, there were many strange commixtures. In those days, the rudimentary patterns of man and animal interbred, as there was no clear vision, no clear distinction between them. And out of that interbreeding came monsters. And out of these monsters, as uh, Sanchroniathon tells us, came strange creatures that ultimately perished away because wherever a monster of this kind was born, like the hybrid, it was sterile. And therefore, orders of life began to disappear. And we have a very uh, important study back in there, but it's going to take a long time to unravel it. <laughs>
because still we are dealing with situations in which your fossil remain is of very little value. Your fossil remain cannot give you in the early Lemurian period very much that could have survived. In the later Lemurian period, perhaps those first uh, fragments that we now honor so great, such as the Pithecanthropus erectus and uh, the Piltdown man and the Neanderthal man and these bone fragments uh, that are our only link, but which do tell us that man has been here as a human being, potential at least, for millions of years. In the Lemurian period also, something else happened that uh, was of tremendous importance. And that is the transition gradually in the formation of the bisexual creature from the androgen. Nearly all primitive forms of life as we explore them, and even today rudimentary forms of life in water particularly, are androgynous. And your sexually polarized entity or being when it arose, began immediately uh, to contribute two factors. The first factor being the need for two creatures to reproduce their kind, and the opposite polarity being the release of one pole of creative energy for the stimulation of the mental psychic organism. Thus, by breaking the ring of the gods, by stealing this ring away, man became a thinker. By breaking the circuit of generation within himself, he became dependent upon another creature to complete generation, but he also became capable of thought. But he also, whether he realized it or not, caused another circuit. This the primary psychic mental, mental circuit, which also requires polarization for creation. This we have not entirely come to understand up to the present time. So in the older tradition, it was during the Lemurian era, or great epoch of time, that man as we know him emerged into the progenitor type with which we are uh, more or less familiar today. We learn, we learn also that in the struggle for this growth, that man gradually came into possession of his sensory powers. Obviously, the primary world had very little need of sensational fa function as we know it. We are told, for instance, that the sense of feeling, which is the most generally diffused of our senses, was the earliest, and the sense of sight the last to be added. The sense of sight is an exceedingly perishable one and is already, generally speaking, beginning to fail. It is the sense of sight, psychologically, which seems to be strangely involved in the gradual rise of our great materialistic culture. The eye has destroyed man's internal vision. And actually, the eye is an externalization of that internal vision. And gradually, man, through the development of the sense of sight, has become hopelessly involved in the illusion of matter. This was his last faculty, and perhaps the one uh, which he will first lose. The other faculties of sensory perception were compensated for by the activity of the pineal gland. And in the Hyperborean period particularly, this vegetable-like antenna, very much like the antenna of the insect, was available as a general organ of orientation. A man originally developed organs of sensitivity but he still depended largely upon internal vision. And it was not until his orientation in the Lemurian era that the organ of internal vision was finally closed. A man was forced to go forth to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow.
He was launched into the material world and what had previously been his inner life or his contact with the causal sphere behind retired gradually into the condition of folklore. This is also repeated in the small child who possesses certain psychic factors and faculties until it reaches uh, from five to seven years of age when these faculties have a tendency to disappear. They disappear particularly as the uh, development of the skull closes the sensitive area at the crown of the head which lies directly over the pineal gland or the ancient third eye. Now we have this Lemurian area, this vast distribution of land producing gradually a primitive people. This primitive people began to cultivate certain values and virtues, but we begin to realize another problem. Here is a world gradually coming into existence, a great experiment in the retort of nature, a world in which man was already old, but not as man, because he was old from as the protoplasm, he was old as the plant, he was old perhaps as a geological creature back in the early days of prismatic crystal forms. But he was there a long time. But he was also being moved. And the ancients were of the opinion that during this long cradle land time of man, that it was necessary for him to have been under certain guidance, under certain leadership or direction. And this was particularly true when finally man made this strange jump in the dark, which is said to have occurred at the time, approximately the middle of the Lemurian epoch. At that time, the being which was awake and alive on the magnetic planes behind the physical earth, which had previously only experienced its body as a dream, suddenly fulfilled the Narcissus myth suddenly enamored of its new form, fell into it and was drowned in matter, and was no longer able to escape back. It was descending like the child into material birth. Prior to birth, prior to quickening particularly, the being is in a condition to work upon its body. But once this quickening occurs, the being is locked in the body in a state of total unconsciousness. And from there it must gradually escape, fighting its way first to birth, then to growth, then to maturity. It must force its way through this wall of matter. Now in the ancient times it was believed when this great balance was achieved in the Lemurian epic and the humanity that we know, the true humanity, first made its complete step into a primordial human form, was locked therein and went to sleep in this thing which preceded the Cro-Magna and preceded uh, the Piltdown Man. This thing that was much like an animal, perhaps could not be told from one. And this human being was locked in that, this human potential. Then according to the ancient writings, came the period in which the gods, or the celestial teachers, the leaders, those who were the keepers of mankind, uh, began to appear as the shepherds, as the keepers of the flocks. And we had the uh, setting up of the great empire of the gods, uh, and the establishment of priestly orders, or of esoteric hierarchies the purposes of these being to guide humanity through the long darkness of embryonic development and infancy. These were therefore the fathers, the Petras, the great ancestral ones who are said to have come from the moon and from other distant places and became the keepers of men. For just as the human being must be guided into birth and through the darkness of total infancy by its parents. So the whole race of human creatures had to be guided into birth and through infancy and through early adolescence 
by the establishment of the great orders of rulership. These orders of rulership were originally the priest-king orders. They became the basis not only of spiritual government but of temporal government. But most of all, they were the parents. They were the, the ones who knew, the old ones, the sages, who became the prophets, the teachers, the messiahs, the guardians of this world half-born which could not yet lead its own way into light. So when man became man, then became the need for the setting up of the great protective instrumentation, because man possessed greater power than any other creature that had been fashioned. Therefore the danger of man misusing this power, of destroying himself with it, had constantly to be faced, and the higher orders of life represented in the ancient writings, the gods of the Puranas and the Vedas, these deities moved in as the keepers, as the custodians, the shepherds, the psychopompus of souls, and became uh, now in our legendary the gods who walked with men in the beginning of things the angels who were in the Garden of Eden, who uh, taught Adam and Eve, all these mysterious references to the great teachers of the prehistoric era, not the ones we know in more modern times, but the ancient ones who are now myths almost, the great Manus of the first cycles, these strange dim figures of the god mortals and these great form of the invisible government of the planet that slowly assumed proportion and took over the management in the darkness when men could not govern themselves. So the Lemurian epic became important for this rocking of the cradle that was to finally produce the next great order of things. Now the Lemurian era, according to what record uh, we have of it, was finally broken up, disrupted, shattered by tremendous earth convulsions. It was uh, in that time that the primitive world was shaken to pieces. Perhaps those of you who saw uh, the um, musical film that Mr. Disney did, in which Tchaikovsky uh, directed the music, in which the prehistoric world and its monsters were represented in animation, will realize something of this idea that the, there was in that time a great shaking and shuddering of the earth, or as the old records of the East used to say, uh, the great mother turned, lay upon one side and then upon the other, and in the course of turning shook worlds from her back. And this is the thought that is concealed in the idea. And out of this tremendous change and shifting of things emerged the fourth great distribution, which we call the Atlantic Empire, or Atlantis, uh, the Poseidonian world. Now, most people, the moment you mention Atlantis, get an idea of an island out in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, that's it. But that is only uh, in the uh, terms of geology or the geography or geophysics of our problem. That island, the island of Posidonis, was the last stronghold of the ancient world. It was not the great Atlantis. It was the remnant. It was the last part of the great empire uh, to be shaken into oblivion. Atlantis was actually a diffusion like all of the other continents. A part of Southern California was above water in Atlantis during the Atlantean period. Part of Russia, most of India, practically all of Mongolia was above water. Area after area that we associate with existing present areas were above the level of the ocean and there was an enormous area of land in fact, there was a larger land area than there is now. 
but not a land area that contained one square inch that was not in the first covenant because all this is taking place within the boundaries of that first great psychological land statement, that land archetype. And in the Atlantic area then, a new kind of people began to develop. The Lemurian progenitor had reached a certain degree of growth. We will explain this problem of the emanation of racial groups later. All we want to do is to move the general theme as much as we can. The Atlantic distribution did not immediately center in what we call the Atlantic Ocean area. The Atlantic distribution seems to have centered originally uh, in many of those parts of Asia particularly in the area we call China. And here, and in many other parts of the world, sporadic developments of peoples began to be marked. These peoples grew more rapidly, individualized more quickly. And of course, what is important about them, they brought with them, under the guidance of these teachers, that we have mentioned. Uh, the adept fathers, the great ones, uh, they brought a new level of organization and the Atlantean had already begun his rise as an intellectual being. The Lemurian man was still sort of fighting for survival with nature. He was in the process of orientation. The Lemurian man was perhaps equivalent to the small child whereas the Atlantean was reaching out toward that glorious age of human adolescence. He was reaching out toward growth, expansion, power, and everything of that nature. And he attained it. And he moved from one part of the world to another. He drifted into certain commixture with the previous Lemurian factors, he continued to migrate considerably from one part of his world to another until finally at the height of his control of the planet he was extended practically over the entire earth. He was divided into many groups, into many orders. He was a diffusion of peoples just as we are a diffusion now extending with many sub-races and divisions all over the planet. But just as certain nations, certain empires, certain areas seem to rise with us, we might say, for example, uh, that the island of Posidonis could correspond with North America in relation to the rest of the diffusion of our present world order, or the, uh, the great island continent of Australia, or one of these enormous land areas. And by degrees, the Atlantean Empire, the great Atlantic distribution, was eroded away. It did not disappear in the way, same way that the, the Lemurian world disappeared, by great shudderings and shakings. It seems to have been chewed away around its circumference over great periods of time. Some feel that this chewing process was due uh, to the rotation of the earth and the banking up against stratifications which were to be mountains. Mountains probably already existed, but perhaps due to the rotation of the earth, the Atlantic Empire began to erode away, began to fall off, break off here, break off there, until, according to the description left by Solon, uh, at about 12,000 years B.C., nothing remained but the island of Posidonis. This area which had become the final island empire of Atlantis. Now that does not mean that no other Atlantic empire existed, that all the rest had disappeared, but it means the cultural diffusion, the psychological body of Atlantis, had disappeared gradually, broken away. Now when a nation breaks away, when a country breaks away today, what does this mean? It doesn't mean that it just simply 
falls off and vanishes. The usual cause for the breaking up or breaking away of patterns is the infusion of a new culture from somewhere. Something begins eating on it. And about a million years ago, in the upper highlands of the trans uh the Aya, or the people of the law, or the chosen ones, began to migrate down the great Indo-Gangetic plain from the north and began to move into the suburbs of the Atlantic Empire. These people found numerous values and relationships as they went along. Little by little, they eroded away the Atlantean psychology, wherever they conquered it, wherever they contacted it, because they were newer, because they represented a progressive step in the individualization of peoples. And so by degrees, the rise of another tide of nations, another tide of races, little by little the Atlantean Empire was constricted. Little by little its outskirts, like a great temporal empire of today, were cut off by the freeing of peoples, by the emancipation of nations, also by natural cataclysms that separated, until little by little nothing remained except the one great nuclear center of Atlantis, which was the last stronghold of a dying race. Everywhere else, the Atlantean had either accepted mixture with other peoples, or had been exterminated, or had simply slipped into the incredible, incredible uh, crucible of change, and was no longer clearly demarked anymore. They weren't all dead, but they had ceased to have archetypal entity. They had been absorbed into other archetypal patterns. But the Posidonians remained to the end. And it was their island which, according to the ancient record, sank in a single night, carrying 60 million souls to death. This was the end of the power of Atlantis. But uh, let us also remember that the Atlantic Empire never could actually die, any more than the Lemurian could die any more than the Hyperborean or the Polarian could die, because every one of these diffusions still exists right inside of ourselves. We cannot escape it. We are stratified with one layer of culture upon another inside of our own natures. All of these continents that seem to have been submerged have been submerged into us. They have also been submerged into the great psychic field of the planet. They all live and because if we can borrow a little phrase again from Newton, if we see further than these others, it's because we're standing on them. They're all still here. Without Atlantis, our world couldn't have existed. So beside, behind and within every Aryan movement is an Atlantic root. And somewhere that Atlantic root has its tap root going down into the Lemurian soil. Because man has no break in his growth at all. But every condition that exists in a certain age is submerged in succeeding ages, as a new surface is constantly added, pressing the other back, but forming out of this tremendous pressed back content the whole great psychic field of the internal of the individual. So all these things continue to exist and to function and to have their bearing. And every individual of our race has a submerged Atlantis inside of himself with all the other trimmings that go with it. Now this, uh, this loss of the Atlantic world uh, ended uh, the great cycle of material growth of man. For it was in Atlantis in the fourth great field cycle that actually humanity hit bottom. Now we may not uh, like to think that that was possible. We prefer to think we're hitting lower than they ever succeeded in hitting. But that is not factually true. Uh, man is already in the evolutionary arc. He has already completed the involutionary period. Or in the Atlantic era, 
he reached the greatest degree of the densification of his own organism and the greatest consolidation of focalizing of energies upon the material vehicle. He is already beginning the great program of release. This led one of the ancient authors to point out that Atlantis produced many great geniuses on a scientific level, but it never produced a philosopher because the reflective mind had not been born. The reflective mind came with the great rise of the Aryas. And this migration of peoples is also very interesting and carries with it many points that we should remember. Now we wonder, for instance, how humanity, one people, one type of being, can manage to get itself into such a confused social state. It would not seem possible that humanity could be in such trouble. After all, why don't we know we're all brothers? Why don't we start with that premise? That would be all right if it wasn't for Kepler's observation of the significance of the time equation. Time is what has made enemies of us all in the course of history. For time has played a peculiar trick on everything that lives and on everything that generates itself. We know, for example, that from the hinterland of every racial root, races pour out in waves. They do not all flow at once. In every group of people, there are a few pioneers that start out. When we decided to conquer the West, everybody in the East didn't move West. The ones that moved West were the adventurers and also, to a certain degree, the malcontents of various kinds. Some wanted for crimes, decided open country was the best. Some were tired of the limitations and restrictions of the old way of things. They were looking for adventure, for fortune and fame. So a certain level peeled off of our eastern light and went west. Now, after 25 years, a west was built that was different from what had occurred in the beginning. And a West that needed shops and merchants and stores began to develop. Whereupon another group peeled off from the East and moved West to meet the first group. When the two groups met, they both came from the same place, but 25 years later they met as strangers. Each had now had a completely different group of experiences. And the man who had gone first and opened the way kind of resented the fellow that came along and profited by it and hadn't done anything himself. And the man from the east coming out at that time was a little leery of the chap with a gun on each hip. That was something he'd never seen before. Now imagine that instead of a little simple problem like this, that we'll take the motherland of a race and we'll say that at a certain date, date one, out of this nuclear center, a surplus group, either that can no longer be fed or can no longer uh, be maintained in uh, an area that is without great advantages, which was the case in this particular instance, a superfluous group, maybe 500 people, 500 families perhaps, maybe 5,000, who knows. But anyway, this group moved out, and in this particular case, moved south tumbling down over these great mountains, found very pleasant, fertile plain with good land, good uh, uh, material, perhaps a few aboriginal peoples from earlier life race cycles. And of course, immediately we see what happened in the case of the Indic, where we find the development of the Vedic literature which was full of early admonitions to prevent these new people from becoming uh, anthropologically involved in the sediment of earlier races into whose area they moved and therefore created the uncast, the outcast, and all this type of thing. But in any event, here these people come and they settle. The climate is different, the land is different. 10,000 years pass. By this time, most of the culture is different. Even the religion is now a religion of tradition constantly modified by new local circumstances. Perhaps the old religion was one of great 
privation. The individual had to be very strong in order to sacrifice himself for the common good. But in this new lush area where these people had settled, there was no sacrifice. So religion changed, culture changed, art changed. These people became a very much adjusted group. Even the color of the skin changed because the climate was different. Clothing changed. The memory of the ancients was all that was left. And that memory, passing from generation to generation, was deformed by lack of formal perpetuation. No written record in those days. And so even the legends didn't fit together anymore. But everyone was satisfied with the whole thing. And then, you see, after this 10,000 years, up in the hinterland of the mother root, another migration starts out. Now, these two migrations, if they ever meet, are going to meet as total strangers. They're going to have nothing in common. If the first migration had carefully preserved the records of the motherland, they would still be no better off, because 10,000 years of change had occurred in the motherland also. And that wasn't the same anymore. Uh, those who came forth in the second migration could have been given a perfect description of those who had preceded them 10,000 years. They would never recognize them because the descendants did not look the same. So these two charming groups of people, both from the same origin, if they actually got a little unhappy and wanted each other's land or something of that nature, would simply go to war. And having no sense of common origin. Or, as more likely in the early days, there was plenty of land, so they went somewhere else and started another community. Now, these two communities could never be alike. Because by the time the second community got 10,000 years of experience, the first community had 20. In the meantime, in the kind of a sort of a cosmic game of billiards or something of that nature, a third migration came down and impacted the other two. And so it goes. Periodic migrations over a period of a million years, moving downward relentlessly, finally reaching so much congestion in the nearer areas that it was necessary to push further to get this new land to go on and on. And these migrations from Central Asia finally got as far as the British Isles, trying to find a place that had not already been taken by somebody else. They also found the remnants of the Atlanteans functioning. They found a few remnants of the Lemurian, and they probably extinguished a few early animal types that had survived from the Hyperborean period. All they had a few of the real early Lemurian mammals, such as the whale, to concern themselves with. So here was a polyglot, all starting from a unity, with the sense of unity completely lost. And by degrees, we find this great Aryan diffusion of worlds, uh, which was again a great distribution. This Aryan diffusion is now nearly a million years old. We know that whether we recognize it or not, it is changing. 400 miles of the coast of Peru fell into the sea some years ago. Nobody noticed it, except a few Peruvians. <laughs> Somewhere else, something else is coming up from below. We don't notice these things. We are told that our sea coast is changing five inches every hundred years. Well, no one is going to subdivide that for a long time. But what about a million years from now? Ultimately, these lines will not be the same as they are today. There will be other distributions of land. There will be other formations of territorial boundaries. And... According to the old tradition, there will be the sixth great land distribution will appear. And this sixth land distribution will be the sixth great continental structure. And in that sixth cultural field, a new race will be born. A new race in which a new type of being human in appearance, but with a new psychology of life, 
will carry on the next dimension of the great social program which has to do with the development of mankind. The next social program must, of course, be concerned by archetypal extension with a problem. So the second of the next great continental distribution will be devoted to a people challenged with one problem, and a problem which ultimately they will probably solve, and that is the problem of death. That is the problem that has to be solved. That problem must be solved because it has already been solved, but nobody knows it. <coughs> it has already been solved because the first man who lived upon earth is still alive. He never died. We are that man. But how are we going to discover the, the law of controlling this fact? This tremendous biological descent of life is the living of the first being. But the rescuing of this situation, we must know that the secret that the first man knew, the last man must rediscover. For the first shall be last. And this being must again be restated. So in the sixth great organic structural diffusion that will be moved into the theater of life, a race which must solve the great problem that relates to death. And one of the problems, of course, that relates to death is war. So war has got to be solved. But it will not be solved by this race. It must be solved by the next race. Now the question is, does the next race exist yet? For that, I think we should have to wait for our continued discussion, and I think that will probably get a good many folks here to find out about that. But now to go on to another subject, which is, which is not related to this phase of it, but to the fact that the sixth continental distribution, this is continents that we're primarily concerned with, the sixth continental distribution, apparently will center in the great area which we now call the Trans-Pacific Basin, extending from the western part of the United States to Asia, and this great western area. This area may or may not be a solid continent at that time. It could be that there won't be much more land than there is now. There could be some more. But there could be a great rim of culture surrounding this area. And this culture could be bridged by intangibles of air, such as, as the aeroplane, which is killing distances. So your next racial or continental distribution is free of the distance equation, almost totally. What is this leading us to? It is leading us to what we psychologically or politically like to think of as one world. But what is this one world? This one world is the restoration of the first world, and that is your seventh distribution. In the seventh distribution, everything that was locked archetypally in the first must have reached maturity, must have released itself, because in this seventh cycle of each of these great arcs, there has to be the Sabbath or the great day of rest. This is the fulfillment. This is, so to say, the full awaking, and is usually represented in symbolism by a kind of golden age. This is the, the completion of the karma of the thing, uh, that cycle in which all things that have been earned come to pass. But in the larger way of thinking, it is the total release of the potential of the first continent. Now, when the seven continents are complete, the earth is born, because all of this growth of the planet takes place within the embryonic field of the magnetic sphere. The magnetic sphere actually incarnates through the psychochemical fields of these so-called continents. <coughs> 
and the creatures that are engendered in them. And therefore, the complete incarnation of the magnetic field is accomplished only with the seventh continent. Then the planet comes of age. Then the planet reaches the fulfillment of its own peculiar destiny. And having blazed forth its own seven potentials, and having perfected them, the continents become the embryonic principles of planets, and the total planet becomes a sun. So the seven continental distributions become the seven planets of a new system. Now if the original archetype is seven, this has to happen. If the original archetype was nine, then there would be nine cycles, nine of everything, and nine planets. But in our system, it is seven. Therefore, the continents finally become the keys to the evolving of these different levels, which are going to become planets. Each of the six preceding is contained in the seventh. And the seventh and its complete pattern, being a totally expressed potential, uh, there is a very interesting alchemical reference to this particular situation in which it is shown how the metals, which are of course the symbols of your psycho-alchemical mystery, also of course of your races, your continents, every septenary that exists in nature, where these coming together form themselves into a kind of star and out of the six days of creation and the day of rest comes the great six-pointed star of the shield of David with the dot in the center of the Kabbalah. And here we have the six manifestations surrounding the central core. Now if you put the seven, the six and the dot all within a circle, you immediately create the symbolic archetype of a new solar system. Because the circle now becomes the body of the sun, within which again this whole differentiation must take place. And immediately your continents become the new continents of a solar system. Because in a solar system each planet is a continent. And each of the planets in turn has its own way of development. And these planets are fulfilled in the sun. And in the seventh day of the great rest, all of the planetary powers are fulfilled in the sun itself. And when the sun states its own total septenary with the planets, then the sun and the planets burst into a cosmic system. And each of the planets becomes a solar sun. Again, the number determined by the archetypal pattern at the root of the grouping. And there are many universal systems, and there are many cosmic chains, each according to different basic mathematical patterns. But in our concept, therefore, we see the growth of the planet producing seven fields that appear physically as chemical, but which are actually psychological. For these continents, although they come forward as physical symbols, are actually representative of magnetic areas and zones within the psychic organism of the planet itself. Now, the planet is a crystal. An Earth, a planet, is a crystal. This crystal is composed of an infinite number of minute parts united mysteriously and mathematically and capable of being released only by shock or by fission in which the broken parts become miniatures of the whole all the way down through just as in the breaking of crystals. Now what we call a fault or an earthquake fault is one of the lines of cleavage of a crystal the lines of, along which it will break. These faults and all that have to do with them are again part of the psychological anatomy of a planet.
And the planet has organ structure and body just exactly like any other living thing. The great mystery systems of the ancients were diffused around the planet in such a way that the seven vital magnetic cores of the planet were each covered by one of the temples. And these were the seven sacred orifices of the earth where the magnetic fields had their great centers. And each one of your racial groups or your continents flows from one of these magnetic fields, completing itself, exhausts itself, in giving birth to the next, and so on, until the complete septenary is concluded. And having completed itself, these fields, these magnetic fields behind the planetary continents, these are the uh, magnetic zones, these whirling zones, that then become the vortices of new planets, and of course the physical materials are gathered around them. So that this infinite process of growing goes on and on and on, fulfilling uh, uh, the evolution of this great sevenfold pattern. And I think this sevenfold pattern would naturally lead then to a more detailed discussion of the races, which will be our subject for next week. And there are many things about the races that will be very, very interesting to us, and a number of popular bubbles, I'm afraid, are going to be broken in one way or another. But I think we'll do it as pleasantly as possible.